If you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 13, we're going to be doing a, a series on the last night of Jesus' life. Thursday, last supper and all those things that go into that. Uh, and I was, I was thinking about what would I be saying to my loved ones if, if it was my last night. I would probably be telling Jamie to make sure you double clutch the four-wheeler before you get it started. I would be, th- I would be thinking to uh, my grandchildren and what I want to say to them, the, the best wisdom for their life. Uh, I've been bedside next to those who were on their deathbed, and I've heard them giving advice and wisdom. So many times you get the, make sure you love one another, make sure you take care of one another, make sure you forgive one another. you, You get that from them, and we always all agree. But then life happens, and we tend to forget our, our vows to our, our dead loved ones. And I, I think here is a case where the greatest, just, just as Christy just sang, the greatest man that ever walked the earth, who was really God, his very last hours before being caught, captivity, being beaten and tortured, bled out, whipped, and then crucified. What were his last words? And he has foreknowledge, I believe, of what's going to happen. And he's going to have these disciples, if it weren't for his resurrection, they're just going to give up, filter out, and go back to fishing. And he knows that he knows that his resurrection is going to change all that, and they're going to be the powerful disciples going into all the world. And they might have a tendency to become puffed up, proud. I'm one of the 11. I'm one of the, they called it one of the 12 even. And uh, they might have the tendency to become overly proud. I think of pride as being part of our greatest sins. Only by pride cometh contention. If you have contention with, so- with someone, it's usually centered on pride in some way. So Jesus is leaving his very, his very last night, he's leaving the disciples with a tremendous lesson on humility, how to handle the sin of pride. So again, I'm glad you're with me here in John chapter 13. If you're at home, I hope you'll follow along in your Bible. Uh, the title of this message Has Jesus washed you? Has Jesus washed you? And it has nothing to do with baptism. Uh, It has everything to do with accepting Jesus Christ that his blood washed away our sins. He died for the sins of the world. But it's not the whole world that goes to heaven. It's those that appropriate that, those that accept that gift of of salvation, that their blood, that Jesus' blood covered, washed away their sin. If you're with me, let's read in verse 4, John 13, verse 4. He arose from supper. We have those previous three verses in a a sermon for tonight, and I, I just love having the opportunity to preach the particular sermon tonight, but Uh, He arose from supper, he laid aside all his outer garments, he took a towel and he girded himself, girding himself the robe that they had that went down to their ankles or feet. They would would reach down and pull the gown up to here and tuck it into their, their belt. So they had freedom to work. And so he girded himself. When we gird ourselves, it's our preparation to work. Preparation to work for the Lord. He arose from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin 
And he began to wash the disciples' feet, to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now, again, about foot washing. Besides the, the chamber pots, usually in a great house, one servant was responsible. And she, she or he would be the lowest service on, on the a status symbol there. And their job was to keep the chamber pots empty and to wash the feet of those that come into their house. It was a nasty job. And remember, we're not talking about what you've got on your feet right now. We're talking about open sandals, walking on the streets where animals are always walking. And I, I just point out to you again, of all people on the whole face of the earth, as, as Christie sung, he's the greatest, most powerful. And he bends down, he starts washing the feet of the disciples. There are five, le five life lessons that Christ teaches us in this story, and I hope you will learn them and apply them. He's about to leave them, and these are five very important life lessons. One, he teaches us how to love one another by serving one another how to love one another by serving one another. He loves with unconditional love. You see, it's not if love. It's not if love. It's I'll love you no matter what. And this is where some parents make a mistake. They raise their children up with conditional love. You get, you get a home run and I'll, and I'll love you for it. I'll be proud of you. You get straight A's, I'll love you for it. You, do, you clean your room and mama will love you for it. No, you're gonna, you should be teaching your children no matter what, you're going to love them. And then they, they are obedient, hopefully, because of that love. Husbands and wives, it's not if. It's always unconditional love no matter what. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. There is nothing you can do to destroy my love. Even when you are the grossest of sinners, and even though uh, you are grossly disappointing God with your life, he loves you. The prodigal son, the father stood at the end of that lane waiting and waiting and waiting. And while the son was off doing the pleasures of the world and spending his inheritance, the heavenly father still loved him. So he loves us with an everlasting love. He loves us with a victorious love. A victorious love. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us? From the love of Christ. Who or what circumstances shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations? No. Or distress? And so many of us have distress nowadays. No. That's not going to separate us. Persecution? Being made fun of? And it's, supposed, it's going to be getting real in this world with uh, new woke type things happening, shall persecution, no, that's not going to separate us from his love, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. Verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, the Apostle Paul, writing this to the Romans, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, that's demons, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, nor any other thing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I say this again, if you when you find yourself in the pig pen of life, always remember no matter what, he might be disappointed in you, but he loves you no matter what. He loves you no matter what. He loves us with a victorious love. He teaches them that night through humility that he might give an example of his own voluntary humility and servitude. Notice that love is willing to humble itself and to serve. Love is willing to humble, to get down low and to do the work that it might even be embarrassing, but to do the work. Love is willing to humble itself. Very quickly, four quick lessons on humility. Humility is not trusting in self. It's not trusting in your own gifts, natural and spiritual. It's not trusting in them. Love trusts in nothing but the Lord, no matter what. You might be multi-gifted, talented, but make sure you're trusting in the Lord to use those gifts properly. It is not trusting in self or your gifts and abilities, but trusting in the Lord. In my probably one of two life verses comes in here. Trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5. With all thine heart, and lean not into your own understanding. Now, I think my wife's next door, but that's one of her, I've told you before, that's, that's something that from her easy chair right next to mine, looking at the news all the time and seeing the ho- horrible things that are happening, she's, it's her, just her vocabulary. I don't understand. I don't understand. And she'll look to me for understanding. Some things we're not going to understand. So when it says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not upon your own understanding, some things we're not capable of. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Acknowledge him as God, as Lord, as supreme, and he will direct thy paths. And I even, as I look out and I see, young, I see younger people who are looking uh, for guidance in their life. What did that say? In all thy ways acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. He's looking for people to bless, to lead, to guide. He's looking for those who will what? Who will In all your ways, acknowledge him. No matter what comes your way, you will acknowledge him. And he will direct thy paths. And the next part of that verse, Proverbs 3, 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Don't trust in yourself and your own opinions. Bounce them off of the Lord. Use that filter Holy Spirit has given us. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. As I, as I even now look back on my, on my ministry, uh, in my youth, in my old, old youth groups, back in the 80s and maybe 90s, there were some unusually intelligent people, intelligent teenagers, top of the class, that kind of thing but they trusted in their own intelligence. And I think to a one, the the extra special intelligent ones who were trusting in their own gifts, I think to a one, they've all pretty much left left Christianity or at at least backslidden, trusting in their own hearts. He will bless those who will acknowledge him in all thy ways. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Verse seven, fear the Lord 
and depart from evil. It's his evil. It's not your idea of what evil is. It's what he says is evil. In our, in our world today, we're permitted and allowed to decide what's evil and what's not. And to most people out there outside this building, to most people, the only evil are those who would call things evil. We need to be able to call things evil no matter what. So four lessons on humility. The one was humility is not trusting in self, but is trusting in the Lord. Humi Number two, humility is not calling attention to yourself and your acts of service. It is not about self. It is not about self. There are those in our church even today that give so much and do so much and, and work so hard and don't want any attention for it. Some of them are sitting here in this church right now. They do so much and they don't want any attention to it. Humility is trusting in His strength and not your own. Philippians 4.13, one of the most famous refrigerator verses, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Humi humility is trusting that He will strengthen me, that He will give me the strength to get through. Humility is trusting in His strength and not your own. And four, humility is making it Jesus your source of strength and wisdom, not self, not the world, not, not your own intelligence, but his. Not, where do you go to for wisdom? Who do you go to for wisdom? And the problem some of us have is we have close friends who have an influence on us. Our youth, our teenagers, our children grow up in the nurture in the admonition of the Lord with their families and then their church. And then as soon as the wrong kind of attention is given to them, they, they fall. It's amazing. That's too fresh in my mind right now. Humility is making Jesus your source of strength, making him your strength, making him your wisdom, and not self and not the world. I originally said I had five lessons that Christ teaches us. Number three, he teaches us the spiritual of spiritual washing, which is referred to here in verses 6 to 11. If you want to follow along. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. Now, he's going around the room, the table. You've seen the painting. I don't know if that's the right thing or not. That came out of some artist's conception, his mind. But I've been in the room. The actual room, history says this was done. And it's a big, wide room, almost the size of this auditorium. And it's uh, the upper room, right? And... He's working his way around. Everybody's speechless. To them, this is God on his knees. Think of that. Think of that the next time you refuse. You refuse to do something because it's below you. God on his knees working around. And Peter's, with his personality, this is, this is just, it, it can't be done. This is wrong. Then cometh he, verse 6, to Simon Peter. And Peter said unto him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, and I have this on the screen because I love this. This is going to become part of my personal philosophy. What I do, you know not now, but you shall know hereafter. There are things happening in this world right now. Just turn on your TV. It's funny how you can turn on to, you can turn on to almost any channel and get different opinions of what's happening, but it's what's happening in this world today. 
We don't understand. We just have to trust. I've told you my, my, my idea of uh, what, what it's all about because downstream, only he knows the time. Sometime there's going to be a global world community with a one global ruler. And for that to ever happen, and maybe even in our lifetime, we've got to change our government, change our people, change, change our programs. So it's setting it up for a one world ruler, a global society. And whatever, good or bad, and whatever side of the aisle you lie on, I'm telling you, when I see these things happening, I, I just simply see maybe today, maybe next, next week, maybe in my lifetime, there's going to be a rapture and there's going to be three and a half years of, of peace and harmony in which a one world ruler is going to take over, giving peace and a promise to Israel and all the Christians and then three and a half years of horribleness where the one world ruler, one world government is going to take over everything. And unless you have a mark on your wrist or your forehead, you're not going to be able to basically survive. I believe this verse, I'm going to say it differently. This verse works for me. There are things happening in this world I don't know about, I, I don't understand. But someday I can look back. Oh, now I understand. Wow. I loved it when I again discovered this verse. What I do, he says to Peter, you know not now. You can't understand it. But there, there is... There is something wonderful going to happen, Peter. And you can be part of it or you can be on the outside of it. What I do, you know not now, Peter. But you will know hereafter. Verse 8, Peter said, Peter, Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus says, if I wash thee not, you have no part with me. Simon Peter in his quick wit, he goes, then not only my feet only, everything, wash me completely. And what he's really saying there is, and I'll point this out later, I want all of Jesus I can get. I want as much as I can get of Jesus. So not only my feet, wash me entirely. Completely. Verse 10, Jesus says to him, He that is washed needs not, to, needs not save to be, have his feet washed, but is clean in every way. And you are clean, but not all. Who's he, who's he, who's he looking at? Who's he thinking about, Judas? There's someone sitting there in that circle that Jesus probably has just washed his feet that is going to turn Jesus in that night to be arrested. And yet, Jesus washed his feet as well. Even his greatest enemy, Jesus, Jesus washed his feet. You are not all clean. I had three real quick thoughts. Peter, you'll never wash me. You're never going to wash my feet. There are things we simply don't understand. And not just about the future or what's happening in our world today, but there are things we don't understand. They don't make sense to us. I talked to someone this week and really I shot back at them. You mean you're upset because God's not running the world the way you would if you were God. Now, let that sink in. There are those that are upset at God, at Jesus, because he's not doing it the way they expected, the way they wanted it. That's an amazing thing. 
There are things we don't understand. Proverbs 3, 5 again was, Lean not upon your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your being and lean not unto your own understanding. Our Lord Jesus does many things, the meaning of which his disciples do not understand. And But he did say, but you will hereafter. Huh. Jesus said to Peter back, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. We must be cleansed or there's no admittance to heaven. Now, it's not about foot washing. It's not even about baptism. And there's a whole hundreds, if not thousands, of church denominations that, pre that preach that without bap water baptism, you don't go to heaven. That's not what this is saying. But uh, we must be cleansed by Jesus Christ, by the blood that washes away our sins, or there's no admittance to heaven. You must have Christ. Peter responds, Then I want as much as possible, not the least, the most I can get. I want as much as I can get. Good people, when they discover their errors, good people are quick to repent and change, not to defend themselves. Yeah, but... I deserve this. I want this. I've, I've, I've towed the line. I've... And they make excuses for their sins. Make excuses for their bitterness and hatreds. When we're supposed to forgive. Well, those who truly desire to be sanctified, set apart from sin, they desire to be sanctified completely throughout, and to have the whole man with all its parts and powers purified. As I was reading this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, every part. Sanctify means to be set apart from sin to serve using your gifts and abilities, and in some cases you don't have the gift, but there's, there's just no one there else to do it. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus. I said I had five life lessons. The fourth one, he teaches us that some among us are not clean. The disciples all looked around. Who's not clean? Is anyone going to raise their hand? No. Who's, who, what's, who's he talking about? I don't know. And I believe, I believe in my mind, the way I see it, uh, that Judas is going, I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about. That's what happens. He teaches us that some among us are not clean. We're not pure. We're defiled. Verses 10 and 11 are, And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who would betray him, Judas. Therefore said he, You are not all clean. Not all clean because of hidden sin. Not all clean because of hidden sin. Proverbs 30, 12. There is a whole generation of people that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. A whole group of people, and we might be seeing that again now, not clean because of premeditated sin for what you're planning to do. You're not clean. He knows your thoughts. He knows what you've got planned for next Friday night, next Saturday night. He knows. Some of us are not clean because of premeditated sin. Fifth life lesson. 
He teaches us through his example. As we are to teach our children, don't do as I do. Do as I say. That stinks. And it works though when the children are real little. But when they grow, when, as they grow up and they see, they see terrible personality flaws in your life and you're not even trying to correct them, it's okay to have a personality flaw. It's wrong not to be trying to correct it. He teaches us through example in, in our a text again, verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he's finished. He said to them, do you know what I have done? Verse 13, you call me master. You call me Lord. And you say, well, for I am. And there's another claim right there. There's another claim right there. Jesus claiming to be God. He says, you call me Lord. You call me Master. And you say, well, for I am, I am Lord and Master. And very quick lesson, definition of Lord. Supreme authority. The Greek word is kurios. That is God. Savior, you call me God. You call me Lord, supreme being. And so I am. One more case there of him claiming outright to be God. Verse 13 again, you call me master and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. Verse 14, if I then your Lord and master have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, he's talking symbolically, of course, but he's telling us to be willing and humble enough to do the lowest of low, low servitude things for one another, to go the extra mile when it comes to doing things for others. It goes on, for I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. And the WWJD, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? I must do that too. Again, verse 16, verily, verily, I say unto you, he says the servant, is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Happy are thee if you do them. Verse 17. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he says, the servant, doulos, we are the doulos of the world. We are the lowest of lowest servants in any household was called the doulos. So, after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? Jesus knew his hour was coming. He taught the last Lessons of life to his disciples. He taught us to think nothing is below us. That we are to be serviceable to God and the brethren. He taught us to separate ourselves from everything that would either feed our pride or hang in our way or hinder us in what we have to do. He taught us to wash the feet of the grossest of sinners, the worst to him and maybe to us. And again, at that very moment, Judas is wondering, how am I going to make my escape out of this while Jesus is washing the feet of the traitor? So, it is necessary 
to our having a part in Christ washing us. Old Testament, the innocent little lamb was sacrificed and his blood covered the sins of you and your family for, for a year. New Testament, the blood of Jesus washed away our sins for a lifetime. I wanted to close with this reminder. We just had this last Wednesday in our, our ministry of First Samuel. God says, Saul, you're done. Your household is done. Um, we're not passing on the kingship to you, King Saul, because there is a man after my own heart that I'm going to give the kingship to. David. But David allowed power to pollute him. And David committed gross sins. And when he was, uh, when he was convicted of it, shown, shown what he had done, he wrote this psalm. Psalm 51. capsule form with someone. I actually shared this message with, with, with one of, I don't want to say one of us, a satellite person. And here's what they said. They said, that, that all sounds good, but, but I'll take my chances. Christ to wash away your, your sins completely. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power is the closing hymn here? Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus Christ, with all my heart, I pray your hand to be upon the mind and the heart of each one here. With all my heart, Lord, I pray for your convicting spirit if any of us have strayed away from you, have strayed away and not been doing our very best, maybe doing our least. But Lord, you died on that cross. You wanted us to be saved for eternity. Your blood washed away our sins. What a God you are. And your God... And, in your last moment, words of advice to us, serve one another as He served us. Care for one another as He cared for us. Lord, we, we, we fail at that sometimes. We get our eyes on ourself, our own little world and life, and we forget about others. Lord, put it into our hearts, into our minds to serve you and to serve one another. Now, Lord, if there be someone here, someone listening that doesn't know for sure, that should they die today, they would go to heaven or hell. Let today be the day they once and for all end that confusion in their life and they ask you, Curios,
Lord God supreme, into their heart, into their life. Do that now, Lord, come into my heart. I give in to you, Lord. I open the door, come in. I give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen.